Nin explains what's really happened at the Hillsborough disaster. The Hillsborough disaster is one of the most tragic events in English football history. But what really happened on the day where 96 Liverpool fans lost their lives? The story begins Saturday the 15th of April 1989, and it's the FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. It's due to kick off at 3pm, and the match is being held at Hillsborough, the home stadium of Sheffield Wednesday. It's a sellout, and all 54,000 tickets have been sold. By noon, fans have started to arrive, and Liverpool supporters have been allocated the west end of Hillsborough that keeps them away from the Nottingham Forest fans arriving from the south. This also means that Liverpool supporters will all have to pass through one entrance, Leppings Lane. 10,000 Liverpool supporters have tickets for the standing terraces, but they'll have to enter through just seven turnstiles. By 2pm, a little over 2,000 supporters have done so, meaning that 8,000 are still to come. In the hour before kickoff, after passing through the turnstiles, many fans go straight down the tunnel leading into the central pens behind the goal, pens 3 and 4. By quarter past 2, a crowd is starting to build outside the stadium and it increases rapidly over the next 15 minutes. Progress through the turnstiles is steady but slow, and inside, a loudspeaker message asks the people on the terrace to move forwards and spread along sideways. But high fences divide the pens and gates between them are at the back. So the more full pens become, the harder it is to switch pens. The man in charge of the match, Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield, and another officer discuss whether to delay kickoff to give people more time to enter the ground. They decide against doing so. Outside, Liverpool supporters are pressing against the turnstiles, and by 2.45, only 5,000 fans are through, meaning that there are still more than 4,000 fans with tickets for the terraces outside the ground. Thousands are now packed into the Leppings Lane bottleneck. Stationed outside, Superintendent Roger Marshall makes several requests for the permission to open the exit gate to relieve the pressure. Inside the ground, central pens are filling up. Chief Superintendent Duckenfield gives the order and gate C is opened. More than 1,400 fans head in through the gate and many head into the packed pens 3 and 4. The gate remains open for about 5 minutes. The match kicks off just before 3 p.m. and the crush at the front of the pens is getting dangerous. A barrier breaks in pen 3 and people fall forwards, increasing the pressure on those at the front. At this point, people are dying. The sheer weight of the amount of bodies in the pens causes asphyxiation and people are suffocating to death due to the pressure. People's faces are turning black and blue and it's pretty obvious that this is now life and death. As the crush intensifies, some fans escape by climbing over the fence on the front. It's apparent that this is now an emergency, and the police stop the match at 6 minutes past 3. Desperate people are lifted over the top of the fences, and fans in the upper stand try to pull others to safety. Police try to free those at the front through the narrow gate near the pitch, but there are not enough stretchers so supporters use advertising hoardings to carry the injured. Ambulances are slow to arrive and have a hard time getting to the injured fans due to the poor communication between themselves and the police. The first ambulance arrives at 3.14, but many of the fans are already dead. In total, 96 fans died as a result of the Hillsborough disaster, and out of those 96, only 14 ever made it to a hospital. The rest died at the football ground, their bodies laid to rest inside a local gymnasium. In the aftermath, the police blamed the fans, accusing them of being drunk and disorderly, and suggesting that the crowd surge was due to the thousands of fans turning up without tickets. They also indicate that it was the fans who were responsible for forcing open gate C. This, and many other stories absolving the police of responsibility, were fed to the media. In particular, to the most popular newspaper at the time, The Sun, who, in typical tabloid fashion, sensationalized the news and paraded these lies from the police as the truth, which did not endear them to anyone in the city of Liverpool. In 1989, an investigation led by Justice Peter Taylor sought to find out the real cause of the disaster, and later that next year, the Taylor Report came out. They recommended complete reforms of football stadiums across the country, 
and is the reason why there are no more standing terraces in English football. In 1991, an inquest into the deaths of fans concluded that the deaths were accidental, but the relatives of the deceased were not happy with this decision. Over 25 years of fighting and lawsuits ensued, and a new inquest in 2009, led by the Hillsborough Independent Panel, reopens the case. They find that police reports have been changed and or sanitized to absolve them of blame. There had been an obvious cover-up, and the police have been caught red-handed. A new round of inquests begins, and more than 800 eyewitnesses were called to testify in one of the longest cases in British legal history. In 2016, seven years after reopening the case, the jury overturns the initial decision of accidental death and finds that the 96 fans were unlawfully killed on that day, and that Superintendent Duckenfield's actions, the police, and the slow response of the ambulances contributed to the loss of life. 41 of the 96 fans could have been saved if the police responded more rapidly instead of standing by and waiting on orders. As a random side note, despite an apology from the Sun newspaper, the newspaper is still not sold in the city of Liverpool. The people don't buy it and the shops refuse to sell it. So in a nutshell, this is exactly what happened at the Hillsborough disaster. And these are facts that you can easily verify. But who was really to blame for this disaster? It's my humble opinion that the inadequate organization from the police and the stadium design is what caused the disaster. Liverpool fans are not to blame for what happened here on that fateful day. Now, regulars of my channel will know that I'm a Manchester United fan, and at this point of the video, I'd like to apologize unreservedly for the behavior of some of our fans. A small minority of us United fans chant about Hillsborough, and I personally find it to be very disgusting, and certainly not indicative of the majority of Manchester United fans out there. So, if you have been offended by one of ours, I deeply apologize. But there are still some theories out there that could still pin the blame on Liverpool fans, and I'll try and address those now. The theory that fans were drunk and this is what contributed to the disaster. As you can tell from the police reports, they pin the blame on Liverpool fans being drunk and disorderly. And when the 96 fans autopsies were done, they made special care to take the blood alcohol levels of these fans. Now, obviously, this caused a bit of a stir with the families of the deceased, but if we were to use this as a cross-section of fans, out of those 96 fans, only six of them were deemed to have alcohol levels which could indicate that they may have been intoxicated. If you do the quick maths, it's just over 6%. Now, 6% of a football crowd having alcohol in them is an incredibly low number. So the police theory that the vast majority of the fans were drunk is simply not true because 6% is an incredibly low number. The theory that thousands turned up without tickets and this is what contributed to the crush. Back in the day, it was commonplace to try and sneak into football matches, especially during popular games like the FA Cup semi-final, etc. And the police argued that thousands of fans turned up without tickets. Obviously, this was a really stupid move as nobody checked if these guys had tickets or not. But the overall theory remains that there were thousands without tickets that attended that game that day. To combat this theory, what they did is that they looked at the CCTV footage and paused it frame by frame and counted every head. The actual number that went through gate C? 1400 which is less than the thousands that the police alleged, and it's actually about the right number that could have stood in those terraces. It's about right, the figures do add up. So the theory that thousands of fans turned up without tickets is simply bogus. The theory that it's the Liverpool fans' fault because this has never happened before. Actually, it has. Eight years earlier, at a similar semi-final between Tottenham Hotspur and Wolverhampton, the exact same scenario played out, and it was almost the Tottenham fans that got crushed to death. On that day, the police allowed the overflow to actually sit on the field behind the goals, and this prevented the crushing of hundreds of fans. Now, at the time, this was a non-event. Nobody reported on it because nobody died, but the fact that it happened eight years earlier with a completely different team 
indicates that this is not a problem specific to Liverpool fans. The only theory that cannot rightfully be debunked is the fact that the Liverpool fans were actually trying to push their way into the stadium. If we take a close look at the CCTVs, you can clearly see that the Liverpool fans are trying to push in. It, it's there in black and white, you, you cannot dispute this. Now, if they're pushing outside the stadium, when there's no reason to push at all, what are they doing inside the stadium? And furthermore, the other theory that cannot be debunked, I'm sorry to have to bring this up, this is the elephant in the room, the Hazel disaster. The Hazel disaster is a similar stadium crush where Liverpool fans breached a neutral gate and it caused Juventus fans to flee and crush 39 of their own fans. Liverpool fans were found to be 100% guilty of this and it got England banned for five years in Europe and them for six years. This cannot be ignored. And I know it's a separate incident, but it's possible that those same sets of fans were in attendance that day. And it's also possible that if they have that sort of mentality, that it's possible that that sort of mentality played out on this day. Obviously, there's no outright proof of this, and here in England, you're innocent until proven guilty, so technically innocent they are. My final thoughts. My final thoughts is that Liverpool fans are not to blame for this disaster. Poor policing and bad stadium management contributed significantly more than any other factor, and rightly so, in an inquest where they actually found the police cover-ups, the, the right people were brought to justice, so I am of the opinion that Liverpool fans were not to blame. But that's not the question I want you to take away from this video. The question I want you to ask is that can every fan in attendance that day be 100% blameless for what's happened at Hillsborough? Is it solely the police's fault? Is it solely the stadium design? Or maybe, just maybe, there's a small group of fans out there with the blood of 96 people on their hands. I can't answer that question, but maybe you can. Let me know what you think in the comment section below, and thank you very much for watching.